Hi, this is Hong Kong Design Book Club and I'm Soyeon. Welcome to our book review episode number four. Today we are going to review Ruined by Design by Mike Montero. This book is published in March 2019. That means this book is very fresh and current, introducing a lot of ongoing issues in the IT industry. UX designers started to talk about ethics more and more in these few years. A lot of talks and workshops about ethics were conducted, books are published, and you can easily find millions of articles about design ethics from a quick simple search. I think it's a reflection that we started to notice something's wrong, maybe not much as nuclear disaster like the books cover, but we're not naive enough to believe that all we're doing is for helping people and making the world a better place. Mike Montero starts this book with the Hippocratic Oath, one of the oldest known ethical codes in the world, that all doctors need to swear before they start their practice. Lawyers also need to pass the bar, get their license, and even gangsters have a code of behaviors and designers don't have a such thing. Crime is more organized than design, he says. This is the biggest argument that he throws in the book that designers also need to agree on a certain code of ethics, have a well-run professional organization, and even need to get a license to practice which seems quite radical and controversial at the moment, but I think it's a timely suggestion and we can start discussions around the idea and develop it. He also introduces a designer's code of ethics he wrote, and it seems quite fundamental for me. And I agree that all designers need to share the same level of understanding about their work ethic, attitude, responsibility, diversity, and inclusivity. Have some time to think about the code. Here it goes. A designer is first and foremost a human being. A designer is responsible for the work they put into the world. A designer values impact over form. A designer owes the people who hire them not just their labor, but their counsel. A designer welcomes criticism. A designer strives to know their audience. A designer does not believe in edge cases. A designer is part of a professional community. A designer welcomes a diverse and competitive field. A designer takes time for self-reflection. Ten years ago, we didn't talk about ethics this much. All we discussed is how persona and user journey are brilliant and how design thinking and lean canvas will innovate the business so they can bring more ROI. I was also excited to be a part of this cutting edge industry with a lot of hope and cash and believed tech innovation and market disruption can totally change the world for the better. And then I started to feel something's wrong. Every time I see friends spend fortunes only to get a lucky card from a mobile puzzle game, every time I talk to the younger generation and find out they don't understand the concept of reading a book cover to cover when they can easily get an 8-page summary from the web, every time I tweet that I don't want to watch another white boy story anymore from Netflix and get death threats from white supremacists, I thought something was wrong and maybe we're not making the world a better place. Then I watched Ken Loach's film, I, Daniel Blake. That was the first time I was so embarrassed that I was a UX designer. Watching 59-year-old Daniel Blake can't fill out online forms because he's not computer literate. That means we designers created the world that excludes people in need and cut their lifeline while we are treating them as edge cases. That was a really shocking moment to me, like Mike wrote. We are so fucked. In fact, we are so fucked. It may already be too late for this book. So the first chapter of this book is basically all about how designers destroy the world. If you are watching this video and still think the author and I are being overdramatic and guilty for no reason, then you should check this chapter. I'll list a part of our malpractice. Spreading fake news, getting Donald Trump elected, giving spaces to white supremacists, Nazis, and Holocaust deniers, leaking personal information, selling personal information, making kids get bullied, 
depressed and committed suicide, letting murderer live streaming, getting immigrant babies locked in a cage and deported, creating white bro culture, giving spaces for sexual harassment and death threats, making stalking easier, and many, many more. James Leung designed the software that lied about Volkswagen's diesel emissions, and he was sentenced to 40 months in prison for bad design. Bad design is a crime, and we can go to jail for it. Bad design is also killing people between 2010 and 2015. After a 20-year decline, teenage suicide started rising again, along with rates of anxiety, depression, body dysmorphia, etc. The work we are doing is killing people. There is a chapter called Design Education Stinks, where he points out how our education system is not helping us do a better job. It's interesting that he thinks people who got into design through the side door are better designers than design school graduates. I understand what he means. 10 years ago, there was no such thing like UX major. Many of our generation started their career as an engineer, writer, journalist, social scientist, marketer, etc. Then got attracted to an idea that we should put people in the center rather than only pursuing monetary goals. Being hybrid gave us much more broader perspective, made us better designers. I have witnessed many of design school graduates who majored in design thinking or human-centered design who have excellent knowledge of design methods, but lack of understanding of fundamentals such as how business work, how to take criticism, and how to present their rationale behind their outputs. The author writes, the problem with design education is there is a nearly complete mismatch between education and professional practice. We are not teaching what needs to be taught. I think more philosophy and social science should be included in design education so every soon-to-be designer can learn how to think, how to research, and how to make better decisions. I like using Twitter. I like the feeling that I'm connected to a bigger community. And I learned a lot about how to be a better person and have seen many people who are fighting against violence in their life from Twitter. However, Twitter is also very stressful. I got a lot of harassment from white supremacists, Japanese neo-nationalists, misogynists, and maybe two passionate K-pop fans. And from this book, when I found out that Twitter started out as all white men team, it all made sense. They haven't experienced any of this shit and that's why Twitter is freeway of all kinds of harassments and threats. It is designed to work this way. They were so ignorant that they couldn't imagine some people can have names longer than 20 characters. This is why we need to hire people from diverse backgrounds to properly understand people with different needs, abilities, cultures, and experiences and build a better tool. He says, running an empathy workshop with all white men team doesn't count, don't use culture fit as an excuse, and hire more women and persons of color. This is one of my favorite part of the book. The second chapter is about what we can do to fix it. Mike suggests a lot of specific actions that we can take in this chapter, and the point is that designers need to be gatekeepers and know who we work for. There is a great story introduced in the book. It's about Dr. Frances Oldham Kelsey. She was the FDA employee, and her job was to review and test new drugs before they hit the U.S. market. One of the first drugs assigned to her was thalidomide, a painkiller targeted at pregnant women for morning sickness. It had already been approved in 20 countries in Europe and Africa, as well as Canada. She uncovered stories of women in those 20 countries who'd been prescribed thalidomide and had subsequently gave birth to deformed infants. In spite of all the pressures from the pharmaceutical company and the FDA, she never approved thalidomide in the US. That's a job well done as the gatekeeper and even she was paid by the FDA, she understood she was serving for the women and children affected by that drug. This story tells everything. 
When a client wants to implement a dark pattern to trick people, and your boss also says, go design it, you can always remember this Dr. Francis Oldham Kelsey story to make better decisions. As gatekeepers, at least we need to understand what are the unethical things to do. We all know what dark patterns are and might have fought your boss who wants to trick users and hide information. There are more. We shouldn't be shaming our users by using manipulative language. We can't collect personal data just in case we want to sell them. We can't build a platform for free speech and let users policing content. Targeted advertising can be used to publish an advertisement such as help wanted white men. Digital surveillance can make stalking easier. We also need to think if the tools we build are getting rid of people's ability to think, read, and communicate. And if the tactics we use for better engagement and enticement are ruining people's brains and turning them into addicts. Sean Parker, Facebook's first president, said, God only knows what it's doing to our children's brains. The short-term, dopamine-driven feedback loops that we have created are destroying how society works. No civil discourse, no cooperation, misinformation, mistruth. And his children are not allowed to use this shit. So now we understood how design ruined the world and we should work as gatekeepers. How exactly can we do this? Can we just send some money for charity and keep designing bad stuff? The author says no, no offset. We all should make changes from inside. We need to speak up, get in the room, and make arguments. It's too late to make excuses such as I'm an introvert. We also need to make allies and build community. It's scary if you think you're the only one who pushed things back, but if you know there are a bunch of other people who share the same values and will fight with you, that can make you brave. Think of Microsoft employees who rebelled and forced the company cancel ICE contract that can recognize immigrants' face and get them deported. Or Google staffs who arranged workouts in protest at claims of sexual harassment, gender inequality, and systemic racism. One observation I had about this book is that most of the stories and examples are from Silicon Valley and the US. It would have been nicer if he did a little research and covered more of other parts of the world, since he emphasized the importance of inclusivity and diversity. While there are libertarians with Ayn Rand tattoos on their back in Silicon Valley, there are authoritarians in China and they collect everyone's data and score them into good citizen and bad citizen. There's sexist advertisement all over the internet in Japan, fake news spread out via Kakao Talk in Korea, and in Hong Kong, no one's reading books anymore because they're busy staring at Facebook. They are designed that way. Designers can't afford any more messes, and this book is a timely help. That's it for today. We are running an offline book club every two months. Next time, we'll read and discuss Don Norman's The Design of Everyday Things. If you're in Hong Kong and passionate about reading, follow our Facebook page to be connected. Enjoy our other reviews on other design books such as Practical Empathy by Indy Young and Sprint by Jake Knapp. If you like this episode, please like it and subscribe us. Thank you!